Welcome back to my physics channel. Today we're going to look at the life cycle of a star and we're going to start with some pictures. So here we've got two pictures both from around the 14th, 15th century, might be the 16th century, um, quite a long time ago. But in both of these pictures we can actually see that astronomers at the time had found something new. Now, on the first picture, and you can't quite see it, but the moon is out, and uh, sorry, the sun is out, and these astronomers are pointing out that there are two stars that are bright enough to still be seen in the day sky. And the same with this picture here, which is showing that there's a star potentially during the day. Well, what's all that about? Well, in this session, we're going to explain it and we're going to explore it. So it's all about the life cycle of a star. Now, we need to be able to cover four things by the end of this, this session. We need to be able to describe the evolution of stars that have similar mass to the sun. So basically what the sun is going to do as it grows older. We need to be able to describe the evolution of stars with masses greater than the sun. We also need to talk about the forces acting on a star and explain how the balance of these two forces affects the life cycle of the star. And we're going to talk about that as we go through. So we're going to have some uh, quite interesting drawings today, but it is important that you've got a pencil and a ruler ready to go because this is kind of a flowcharty kind of lesson. So let's go to the visualizer. We're going to start off with this uh, structure that we find in our um, galaxy, which is called the Horsehead Nebula. Now this is a nebula which is a cloud of dust and gas that's been pulled together by gravity, which is going to form our baby stars. We call this a stellar nursery. So let's just make it a bit bigger so you can see. So there's our nebula. This is the horsehead nebula. It looks a bit like a horse head uh, over here. And we can see there are some stars around it. These are our baby stars, our proto-stars, that are being formed in the nebula itself. So we are going to start by drawing a little bit of the horsehead nebula. In fact, this is a slightly different nebula, but it doesn't particularly matter. This is what it is. It's a nebula. And a nebula is a cloud of dust and gases. So dust and gases. Oh, a bit too high. Pull that down a bit. Uh, it's pulled together by gravity. So gravity is bringing those dust and gases together. Now, as gravity brings those dust and gases together, then actually, whoops. So as gravity brings together those dust and gases, what we're actually finding is, so if we imagine we're bringing these four particles together, then we are in fact increasing our density. So we're increasing the density of those gases, uh, which is causing us to bring them closer together. Now, that, as that density increases, it actually increases the temperature of one of the gases. So it increases the temperature of the hydrogen, which is one of the two gases that we find were around at the beginning of the solar system. So that hydrogen then uh, glows and it sort of spirals into the center. Now, as the mass increases, then so too does the gravity. So from the last lesson, we talked about this, where we talked about uh, gravity itself increasing as mass increases. Well, here we're increasing the mass in one space. So the gravity increases. And as the gravity increases, we're going to pull in more dust and gas. So we've got more dust and gases being pulled in and eventually fusion will start 
And once we have fusion of those bits of dust and gases, well, in fact, we end up with our first sort of bit of information or bit of um, structure, which is called a protostar. I'll write it above. But we'll talk about protostars more in a second. So protostars are the next thing that we look at. So if we go back to the PowerPoint here, we can actually see that horsehead nebula in visible light and in infrared. So you can see there's far more structure inside of it in infrared. So we're looking at thermal energy here. And that is why we use telescopes that can absorb different frequencies of light. Okay, so here's another um, example of uh, the nebula, the stellar nursery, because we have now got some protostars in frame. Here's a protostar here, and here's a protostar here. So those protostars are our starting stars, and those are what we're going to uh, continue our story with. Okay, so protostars. Protostars are what have, have formed, and it's the starting point of our fusion process. So we have our protostars, they're sort of depicted a bit like this because they've got gases coming out of them. Um, they're not particularly stable, but those protostars are starting to fuse. And we've got fusion taking place. Remember, we've got hydrogen plus hydrogen coming together to give us helium plus some energy and it's that energy that's then emitted as that uh, em waves that are coming off the protostar itself so the light and the thermal energy the visible light and the infrared energy so once we go beyond the protostar we end up with a star sometimes like our star and later on we'll find out in this lesson that there are other stars types that we'll talk about but this is our sun here and our sun was formed four and a half billion years ago when it formed from that cloud of dust and gas from a, a nebula like we've talked about and it began a protostar and then became what we now call a main sequence star and a main sequence star is where the star is in sort of its prime of its life. It lives in the main sequence for quite some time. And it's the longest, most stable period of a star's life. Well, a main sequence star is quite stable because there are two forces taking place that are balanced. Remember what we know about balanced forces when the forces are balanced, there's no motion of anything. There's no acceleration because F equals MA becomes zero. So those two forces we need to talk about, we have got in red here the thermal expansion of the star. Thermal expansion because it is hot. The gases are hot. They're moving quickly. And that means they are trying to escape from the star. So thermal expansion. Now, if we didn't have any other forces, the star would just expand. It would just keep blowing up. But we do have other forces. We have a balanced force here. And I'll draw it on three times because it is uh, balanced. And this is our gravitational force. So it is the force of the mass pulling back the edges and those two are balanced. So in the main sequence star, we've got the thermal expansion is equal to the gravitational force. So the star doesn't get any bigger. So it, it remains stable with a stable size. Okay, so that's that's where our star is right now. It is a main sequence star. And it will exist as a main sequence star for quite some time. It's converting hydrogen to helium, as we talked about in fusion in terms of our protostar, and beyond and beyond, and go to lithium and beryllium, etc. Keep building up and up and up, up until iron, which is the largest it can get to. 
quick recap about fusion. Remember, this is the joining of two small nuclei to release energy. So hydrogen isotope and hydrogen isotope coming together will give us helium plus some energy as well. So we are fusing together two smaller parts or particles into one bigger particle. Now, what happens to our star when it reaches sort of the end of its life? Well, it becomes a red giant. So the star itself expands. It goes from being quite small and gets much bigger, expanding away because the thermal expansion is greater than the gravitational force. So the outward forces are bigger than that gravitational force and it'll expand until those forces become equal. And once they become equal, we're in our red, uh, red giant phase. And the red giant will happen to our star in the future. We know that's going to happen and the star will in fact probably engulf the Earth. It will be a big star. So we call this the Red Giant. So the star has expanded and that is because the Thermal force is greater than the gravitational force, which means it expands outwards. So that's the next stage of our star. It, it expands into a red giant. Now here's a scale diagram for you. On the left, we have the Sun as a main sequence star, so diameter of about 1.4 times 10 to the 6, or 1 one hundredth of an atomic uh, of an astronomical unit, which is uh, the distance from the Earth to the Sun. That's what we call one astronomical unit. And here, the Sun as a red giant is in fact a hundred times bigger, so it's expanded massively. Now, what happens? When it reaches the red giant, well, that is where the star has fused all the way up to iron. And it can't fuse any further because you have to put energy in to get cobalt. So up until iron, you're gaining energy and you gain less and less and less energy the bigger the atom becomes. But you reach cobalt and suddenly you need to put energy in to your fusion reaction. And that's not possible in this situation. So we go beyond the red giant, we end up with what we call planetary nebula, which is where we've got a small core left in the center and all around the edge, a bit like a fried egg, we've got these really beautiful uh, shapes where the outside layers of our star are escaping into the space around it. So this is what we call a planetary nebula. And some of the um, elements that have been fused at this point are escaping to space and they're, they're going to be reused. It's kind of a recycle process. And we've got some more pictures here. That's the end of a red giant's life. The outer layer drift off into space. And this one especially is called the Eskimo Nebula. Here we've got the Cat's Eye Nebula and the Helix Nebula. So they are really quite beautiful um, structures. And what we're left with right in the centre is a white dwarf. Now, it's a very, very small object left in the solar system. It's white because it's still emitting every single type and colour of uh, electromagnetic radiation. It's still extremely hot. And as we know, when you put all the colours together, you end up with white. And this is a white dwarf here that's about 1 in 1,000 light years, uh, about, sorry, it's about 1,000 light years away from Earth. So the light from this takes 1,000 years to reach Earth. So if you're looking up at this in the night sky, you're looking at light that's 1,000 years old. And that's kind of the end of the story with regards to stars that are our size. We could 
potentially have something called a black dwarf in the future. And we call those hypothetical stars because we've never seen one. So it's where a white dwarf has cooled down. But as you can see here, it would actually take longer than the time we've had of the universe, the age of the universe, for a white dwarf to cool and become a black dwarf. So we haven't seen any yet, but we predict that's what's going to happen. Okay, so let's go back to the visualizer now. And let's draw this out in its entirety, one half of our story for a life cycle of a star. So we started with our nebula. We looked at the Horsehead Nebula, but there's also this uh, different one that Hubble found. And these are called uh, just nebula, or in fact, you can name them as, um, as stellar nurseries. So beyond the nebula, we've got the protostar, which is basically a baby star, and it's not a very stable star at this stage, but it's becoming more stable. Now we've looked at small mass stars here. So a protostar goes into a main sequence star, and that main sequence star exists for a while, it then becomes a red giant, which is where it has expanded out because those thermal forces are greater than gravitational forces. Beyond the red giant, we then end up with that planetary nebula, which I'm not going to draw in, but I am going to draw a white dwarf as well. So those are the stages for small stars. What about for big stars? What about if we've got um, a situation where, in fact, let's just add here, so this is about the mass of one sun, roughly. Okay, so what about big mass stars? Well, we still end up with main sequence stars where they're stable, but they are big main sequence stars. They're much larger. So it's still a main sequence star. Now that main sequence star will still use up all of its uh, elements and will be get heavier and heavier. And so the outer layers will uh, sort of move away. And this is a super red giant we're not great at uh, coming up with names in physics so we've got a super red giant that super red giant now has two options in fact that super red giant has masses that are so big in the center it's got a core that's so heavy that it can pull those outer layers back in so that gravitational field is in fact big enough to pull the layers back in. So we don't end up with a planetary nebula like we have here. We bring these edges slowly back in and then they speed up as the acceleration increases until they collapse together. And when they collapse together, we end up with a supernova. And that supernova is a big explosion. So the star centers at the center, but we have energy being used to keep fusing. And in fact, we fuse beyond the iron that we got to so far. So elements beyond iron can be made, but we have that supernova taking place there. Now I've run out a little bit of space, so I'm just gonna have to start again. So we've got two more little bits that we need to consider. So supernova again. Now, if it's a smaller star so not as small as it was for a main sequence star like our sun then so a smaller mass then we end up with what we call a neutron star and a neutron star is literally that it is a star made up of neutrons so it is just neutrons inside of it so the whole core the whole star 
is just neutrons and that has a very high mass because as you can imagine the neutrons will stack together they've got no charge they're not pushing away from each other so very very high mass in fact, I seem to remember a, a teaspoon of neutron star was enough to uh, be about the mass of the Earth, something like that. I mean, they are, they are hugely dense materials. And they're a little bit boring. I mean, they emit some gamma rays uh, in either direction, uh, and they have kind of what we call a pulsar. Um, but if we go for the large masses, the very large masses in our stars, then... They don't just collapse to a neutron star. They, in fact, collapse to a black hole. And the black hole has so much mass. Now, it's not a hole before we go that way. There's no hole in space. It's nothing to do with that. It is still probably a spherical object, but it's a spherical object with so much mass that it traps light and light can't escape it. So... Even light coming close by here. Let's imagine this is a light uh, light photon. It's going to spiral down into it. So light can't escape. So a black hole is a very, very high mass object which does not allow anything to escape from it. And that's our large masses. So small masses, neutron star, large masses, black hole. Really important that you get that bit of information down. Okay, so let's have a look at some pictures because I think this is quite useful now. Um, so here is a picture of a supernova. I think it might in fact be an artist's impression, but we have got the core in the center here and we've got the edges moving away after they've collapsed back in. So they've collapsed back in together and now they're moving away. They've rebounded off that core. Okay, so how are supernova formed? Well, remember the process. We've got protostar, main sequence star, super red giant, supernova. Well, up until the super red giant, what we're doing is we're fusing hydrogen all the way up to iron we cannot get beyond iron because going beyond iron we need to put um, energy in to that fusion process so hydrogen goes all the way up to iron so we're fusing those smaller elements into the bigger elements those iron nuclei actually start to absorb energy so up until this point we're gaining energy iron starts to take energy back in which means that iron is going to slow that reaction down. So the number of fusion processes taking place per second is going to reduce, which is going to mean the pressure is going to reduce. There's less of those hot gases moving around, which means that the outer layers are not being held up. So that thermal expansion, the pressure due to the thermal expansion, is going to get smaller. So the outer layers start to collapse back in due to the gravitational force. So as they collapse back inwards, they then collide with the core, which is causing a massive amount of energy to form. And that allows us to get beyond iron. So in the supernova itself, we can get from iron up to uranium. So any elements between iron and uranium can only be made in a supernova, but we'll talk more about that in a second. But it's that collision of the outer layers collapsing back onto the core, which is resulting in that huge explosion, which is then creating these elements that are or fusing to give us these elements that are further up the periodic table. So supernova are dying stars that explode violently. They're bright for weeks, months, possibly even years, long time. We thought one was going to happen very recently when we were looking at Betelgeuse, but unfortunately it didn't happen. It would have been quite an amazing sight to have seen. When they, um, when the supernova explodes, when it kind of um, happens, they emit visible infrared and x-ray radiation. The temperature can be between, what well, can go up to 10 billion Kelvin, which is really high. Lots of kinetic energy there. And there's enough energy in that collision to cause those medium weight elements to fuse all the way up to uranium. So looking at the periodic table, 
we can see we're going from cobalt 27 all the way up to uranium down here at 92. So any of these elements, uh, including uh, cadmium, silver, palladium, um, tin, uh, lead, copper is in there somewhere, copper, copper and zinc, which your bodies are made up of, you have copper and zinc in your body, can only have been made in that supernova. So there is quite a lot to be said about supernova and how important they are for life. So here's some pictures of supernova. They're very rare. We're looking at one every century roughly per typical galaxy. And um, it could be quite hard to spot them. So they are quite important. And here's a, here's a kind of picture of a black hole to give you an idea. Sucking, uh, sucking pulling the light into the, um, the event horizon, bringing that light across because it can't escape uh, and uh, being pulled into that high gravitational field. There's no way of escaping it. Uh, and there is a neutron star for you as well. So it's a neutron star, that's the Calvera, which is our closest neutron star in the constellation Ursa Minor. And it's made pretty much entirely from neutrons. And they're all compressed together like a giant atomic nucleus. So here is your life cycle. Let's just go through it again. We have star forming nebula, which form our protostars, main sequence stars, red supergiants. Uh, we then have those explosive outbursts, which cause the supernova. We've got black holes, we've got neutrons, and then the, rub the chemicals that are recycled are then go back into the interstellar medium and form nebula again. So this is the life cycle of those massive stars. And remember, we've seen that you can have a process that can have two branches with two extra branches at the end, which is really important to know. Uh, so here are some pictures of some star formation as well. At this stage, I'm going to link you a video below that I'd like you to watch, which is all about the life cycle of the stars by the Institute of Physics. It's a really good video, well worth watching. And um, I'm going to end with just this section here. So let's go to the full screen for the PowerPoint so you can see it. I'll just read through it and um, hopefully you'll understand why this process is so important. Once upon a time in a nebula far, far away, a huge cloud of dust collapsed and a star was born. For millions or billions of years, it converted hydrogen in its core into helium just like our sun does. It may have provided light and warmth to planets just like Earth. As the star got older, it started to run out of hydrogen and began to expand. It became a red giant. As its core temperature increased, as carbon atoms formed from the fusion of helium atoms, gravity pulled the carbon atoms together as the temperature increased and additional fusion processes proceeded, forming oxygen, nitrogen and eventually iron. It would have been very bright in the sky. The core temperature rose to over 100 billion degrees. As fusion in the core ceased, in less than a second the star collapsed on itself. When the star exploded, it scattered heavy elements that only a supernova can make. We could not exist without those elements. So you really are made of stardust. Because without those supernovae making those elements that are greater than iron, we could not have life as we know it existing. So there we go. That is our lesson on the life cycle of a star. As always, if you've got any questions, if there's anything you want to know further, you know how to contact me, do contact me. Um, I will leave you some tasks on the assignment on Teams. Thank you for watching and I will see you for the next one.